thanks. So first of all, thank you for being here. And uh, the first question is actually if you can introduce yourself. Where am I? Yeah, I'm Rob Irving. Uh, I've been uh, involved, I suppose, uh, in the crop circle phenomenon for well over 30 years and, and making them as well. And um, not so much lately, you know, I'm a, I'm a veteran circle maker, I suppose, and I come out for opportunities like this to talk about, in, you know, what interests me about the circles. Um, but uh, yeah, now I've sort of moved on. We, we do, we've, we've, we're known, myself and some colleagues are known for doing commercial work. And uh, so occasional jobs come up and, and we do those, but actually to be frank, we get a bit old for it now. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm Rob Irving. I used to write about the subject as well. So I used to write articles for the 14 Times and, uh, and also uh, the Independent and other Sunday supplements. And um, I used to uh, have a co-writer called Jim Schnabel uh, years ago. So, um, so yeah, and I think uh, some of my writings used to piss people off a little bit sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we as circle makers used to see ourselves as uh, having a, just as much right to a seat at the table as uh, our, our opposites, you know, the circle believers and uh, and the um, people that led them, uh, who rather we didn't have a seat at the table, and, or, and, and who would rather we shut up, but uh, we, we, we never did somehow, and, uh, and we were just as interested in the mysteries as, as, as they are, that's the irony. Anyway, that's me, Robert. And uh, what's the reason behind it? What's the reason why you, you're actually making crop circles? So I, um, my introduction was to, uh, I went to a talk, I saw a talk advertised in Glastonbury with um, a chap called George Wingfield, who was a field officer of the Centre for Crop Circle Studies, very important role, and he was quite a self-important man. And, uh, and uh, he was giving a talk, but before he was allowed to talk, uh, a guy in the audience jumped up uh, and um, said that he had a, he'd, he'd worked out, he could interpret the symbology of the circles. And uh, so he gave us this talk. His name was Eric Beckyard. He, he was known at the time as Eric the Viking, and he had a museum in San Francisco. It was the world's biggest ball of string museum and Loch Ness Monster Museum. So, yeah, so that gives you an insight into Eric. And he was a real character and he was a very entertaining, but he, he, con he had converted um, these symbols that were appearing in, appearing in the field back then in the 80s. Uh, and he, 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 he reckoned they were a mixture of Tiffanag an African language and uh, North African, I think, and um, Korean. Uh, and he sort of mixed Tiffanag and Korean and came up with the meanings. So, and he also reckoned that you would leave the vowels out, so it'd only be the consonants. And he he came up with a T, an H, and an R. And he said that it, therefore, no other word. Um, works with it except Thor or Thor, the Viking god. And, uh, and I put my hand up and I said, Earth, E and A, take those away and it's the same consonants. And he said, what's your name? And I said, Rob. And he said, we'll, we'll talk about that later, as if he, as if he kind of, um, as if he was ready for it, but it completely floored him. And so the answer to your question is, at that time, people like George Winfield are saying, we don't know what it is, but we know what it isn't. And it isn't people making them. And I immediately became uh, interested in testing that. So it, it started off as a scientific issue. Could we make a circle that people would take as a genuine circle? And that turned, about, turned out to be extremely easy it was a 30 meter or 30 feet wide circle as all circles were around that time and um and yeah so but then uh, then i became hooked uh 
I mean, at first it was kind of funny, you know, that uh, we sort of how easy it was to show. But uh, then I became hooked upon what it was actually generating. So you'd go out at night, you'd make a what we were defining as an artwork, because that's what we were. We were artists, and we tried to. We used to have lots of arguments over the kitchen table in London about in what way is it conceptual art? How how is it art? Um, what about the gallery? You know, well, you bring the audience to the field. You just don't use, don't have to have a gallery, and that 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 rang. That some people had difficulty with that, and um, so. It, so eventually, and eventually I did a PhD about that exact question, about how to view circles in terms of conceptual art, you know. Indeed, um, also an attachment to prehistoric monuments, because I see prehistoric monuments in the same way as some kind of conceptual art. It's just, it's just having a different position of what we mean by conceptual art. Uh, so it then became thoroughly interested in the subject, just as interested in, as the people who are um, receiving them, you know. Uh, but I became interested in the mechanics of, and the process of making and having people respond in a certain way. No laughter involved, no judgment, just interesting, you know, how human beings react and the, the role of ritual in that participation as well. Why, why go to crop circles and perform certain rituals, you know, meditation, dowsing, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I just became really interested in, in that became the phenomenon uh, for me. And I wasn't that interested. I, I, I didn't think it was made by aliens or I had no, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for a cause outside the human. So I guess I was taking a, an anthropological perspective as it being something that humans do together, whether you make them or whether you accept them, you know, same process, what happens, you know, and that, that interested me. I did the PhD because I wanted to actually figure it out and be paid to, um, figure it out and the government kindly funded my PhD um, and uh, so I spent three or three, three and a half years with, uh, figuring that out just so that I could articulate it you know because I, I, knew, I knew there was something interesting going on and I knew why I was going out there because it was so interesting and, and a fantastic experience to be out in a field with the badgers and the birds and the, even though the birds are asleep, and uh, the wildlife, um, deer, um, and occasional humans that you would have to kind of hide from, just like a deer would, or run away from. Or, um, so it became very animalistic, and I used to enjoy that. And uh, uh, yeah, and so my interest is now not so much in that experience, although I look upon it wistfully, but um, you know, as a phenomenon of human behavior, it still really, really interests me. So. Okay, so yeah, in terms of wording, so what, from your perspective, uh, would it mean uh, a real crop circle, authentic, genuine, uh, man-made rather than aliens made? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that? Will you be able to? Well, it's, it's a really interesting subject. Um, and lots of discussion has gone on about it. Uh, there's, in crop circle world, there's an assumption that genuine means non-man-made. Um, that, of course, is wrong because you can have a genu genuine Chippendale chair and that's not, not been made by people. It was made by Chippendale, which is why it's called that. Um, I think what the confusion is, is uh, between, a, it's an aesthetic problem. There's an assumption that the cleanest, tidiest, most complex cookie cutter crop circle is genuine. And if it's a right mess, it's made by people. Uh, there's a general, general. There, there always was this general n new age uh, uh, 
feeling that anything that we do is essentially rubbish and that there's this uh, God character who is capable of the perfect thing coming down and landing on Earth. So, and, and, and so the argument follows that um, it's not possible to be made by people. So it's uh, genuine, is something that's not possible to be made by people. But it's, it's just semantics, really. Um, as I say, it's a Chippendale chair or a you know, Chesterfield couch. You know, they're, they're genuine, genuine objects and they're, they're all real. Even the crops, all crop circles are real if it's there and it's flat. Um, it's just this confusion about the aesthetics, this idea that humans aren't capable of the perfect. But you only have to look under a, a Honda uh, bonnet, hood, and look at the engine to see what humans are capable of. I mean, they're capable of quite astonishing things. But there is a bit of a thread with this sort of conspiracy idea that, you know, we, we, we could never manage to go to the moon. You know, lots of stuff is quite derogatory towards human beings and uh, uh, in favour of this sort of ideal, which is kind of godlike. Um, and the crop circles are no different. Um, to me, I have a different interpretation of genuine. I think it's, I think genu a genuine crop circle is one that attracts more, the most people to it uh, for picnics, dowsing exercises, group therapy and, and all sorts of activities that go on, analysis, scientific analysis. To me, scientific analysis, to me, science is just another other amongst others. It's, it, it's, I don't think sci uh, crop circles are a scientific problem. So I think to uh, approach the problem from a scientific perspective is uh, quite redundant, really because it is, as Doug Bauer famously said, it is only flat and weak. You know, it's how it's flattened and, uh, you know. Um, yeah, uh, as, any, as any agronomist work worth their salt would know. Yeah. Um, so that's genuine, but and to, within the uh, croppie community, um, the opposite of genuine, was hoax, and that means uh, a crop circle that has been made by people. It's a hoax. But actually, the word hoax implies an intent to make fools of people uh, that isn't there. It's, I don't think it's really ever, with some circle makers now, some might have that feeling, but as far as 30, 20, 30 years ago, there was, there was no sense of making it in order to make fools of other people. It was always what will happen if we flatten, if we make this pattern in, in, on the earth? Uh, what will it generate? And we were quite interested, not from any particular, well I, I you know, did, did research on it, but my research was really about the power of anonymity, you know, the power of anonymous art. When it's so anonymous, not not like Banksy. Banksy's not anonymous. He's Banksy. But with our work, it was believed that even human beings weren't doing it. You know, it was so anonymous, it wasn't even human. So I became interested in that. How um, and other 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 theories were put uh, in advance of perhaps the scientific one, the obvious one, where it's uh, people making patterns uh, and becoming good at what they do you know, and not telling anybody um, and that was sort of the choice was to see that in terms of uh, deceit and uh, you know people feeling deceived and but they never felt deceived about our circles because we never told them that we've made them there are circles out there now that will never ever ever be claimed by people because we won't do it, because we have a pact, and we've had it in for 30 years, you know. Um, because the circles don't work if people think people have made them. They're just flat and weak when people make them. It's only when people think that people didn't make them, or it's not art, that it acts successfully as art.
fantastic art because it's it's, it's it's fulfilling an artistic function of generating behavior, behavior change in, in, in the audience and that's really like theatre does you know and that's interesting to me but it was never set I mean it was no more set out to deceive as, as you would argue that an actor sets out to deceive by playing a different role you know? yes that's a certain amount of deceit but it's certainly not you know, intended to uh, you know, uh, be at the audience's expense. You know, clowns, maybe, but uh, yeah, and circle makers. You know, we all operate the same. Te we all tread the same boards, really. And um, but there is an interesting origin of the word hoax, and it is the Latin hoc est corpus dei. This is the body of Christ, and um, that got shortened. To hocus pocus, which was a sort of universal word used in magic. Uh, that's a derivative of hocus corpus day, and and the word hoax is thought to come from hocus pocus. It's just a shortening of the term hocus pocus, creating magic, which is yes, I suppose the, uh, they are both genuine and hoax at the same time. Um. I used to know and be very good friends with, uh, well I met Doug and Dave, the original old, old geezers that claimed to have made all the circles or, or attributed as saying that, I don't think they ever claimed all of them, but, um, and uh, Dave died in 1996 and uh, leaving Doug and we uh, were in contact and having conversations about all this stuff until until basically the week he died um, in 2018 I believe I wrote his obituary and I read it out at his funeral and uh, read his as a eulogy I suppose we were very close so I know well what was in their mind in the mid 70s when they started making crop circles and they came from an interest in ufology and uh, Doug said that he was so fed up with waiting for the aliens to arrive as, as he was being promised uh, because there was a sense of anticipation that he thought they should go out and make it look like they had arrived hence the and they, they made these sort of First of all, it was one circle, like a flying saucer had landed, and then it was much, and that was the terminology of the time, in the 60s and 70s. So he was responding to crop circles that were photographed and existed, famous cases, but they were always attached to ufology, and um, famous cases in Warminster. And that's why, I mean, the first ones that were really publicised that they made were in Warminster. And uh, back in the 60s, early 70s, they were attributed to the thing. That was what, they, that was what the phenomenon was, was called, the thing. Because people were photographing flying saucers and, uh, and there were strange sounds. So it, it got this sort of generic term, the thing. And when... Doug and Dave's circles were found uh, near Westbury, or near Warminster. Uh, it was the headline of the local paper was "Return of the Thing," and um, so there's he, he was already acting in response to an to a pre-existing phenomenon. So crops, uh, and, and I have no idea how they got there. Um, it could have been uh, a couple making some space in a wheat field for some private reasons and uh, good a reason as any um, and uh, it could have been weather as it was uh, um, originally thought that Terence Meaden with his uh, plasma vortex theory, theory that was meteorological um, just as just as wrong-headed by the way as some of the people here bored you know as, as he thought that because he was a scientist he was right um, he wasn't. He was no more right than people thought aliens were doing it. Because he, he, the last thing he thought was that people were, were doing it. Um, but, so there is a pre-existing phenomenon of crop circles 
that I don't think uh, anybody since then could explain with any honesty. Yes, you could say people made them, but not with any element of truth or, or evidence behind it. They may, so they may well be a relatively simple phenomenon. I mean, again, we've we've looked at uh, we've gone into fields uh, to kind of uh, plan where to put our big masterpiece that, that night. And on the way into the field in the daytime, we've seen circles that we've looked at. And, and the only thing that we were interested in is, has another human being been in that field? Is it, is it a hot field? Should, maybe we should go use another field where there's no people around. Um, and we've decided that it wasn't a, a man-made circle, but it was a perfectly formed circle uh, I mean, we would, I remember looking in it, and uh, I mean, they're not, not that big, you know, just, but it wasn't human. It, it was probably a, some sort of natural, I don't know, I don't know. I uh, don't get dust devils, really, in this. Some, sometimes you get whirlwind effects, possibly that, but you just have to shrug, and like some of the other phenomena that we've witnessed, you look at it, and you, and you agree you all saw the same thing, but um, you have no explanation for it. Um, and I think even circle makers weren't the type of people to just fob things off and what I call explanationism, where it needs an explanation. You know, some things don't have an explanation. Maybe some things are out there that we've not discovered yet or been able to articulate. You know, and I think there are certain kinds of light phenomena that occur in Wiltshire um, that many people have seen. You know, amber lights uh, flitting around and uh, that sort of thing. With us, it was uh, the exploding light in the sky. It sort of, it was like a balloon exploding luminously and visible for miles and possibly causing some of the flashes that people see. But, you know, as luck would have it, a few of us were making a circle and we, we, we happened to sort of catch it in our vision uh, over the East Field once actually in uh, Alton Barnes. And we all, you know, some of us, some of us saw it, and we agreed we'd seen the same thing. We talked about it, so it definitely happened and definitely witnessed. But nobody knew, nobody could stick their necks out and say, "Oh, it must have been that," because it certainly wasn't anything we it was that we had an explanation for. You know, so yeah. has an origin, and that origin was simple circles. Uh, and uh, like I could uh, talk about newspaper reports in Australia in the 60s um, describing a group of circles, not, not necessarily in any pattern. Uh, the idea of joining them up came later and that was definitely a man-made thing. So, but there are stories, published stories, um, even in science, uh, um, the New Scientist, uh, a report by the eminent Patrick Moore, astrologer and trickster as well, uh, who reported in a letter seeing he described circles in a field long before Dag and Dave, you know, long before the long before the 80s and the late the 70s and the early 80s when when the phenomenon kind of rose to public uh, recognition. And, and then it got to about 1990 when after circles started to become joined together like the famous Led Zeppelin album cover that, that really lifted off as it were um, then and so throughout the 80s it, uh, uh, 90s it became quite, there was competition between teams and, and uh, Doug and Dave were still active and um, and realizing that they were being sort of overtaken by bigger teams, you know, younger teams. Um, so we're making bigger and bigger and more complicated circles. So, but, so I think it's, uh, it's it, I think it's true that there is a, a predated phenomenon of circles that predated the first known man-made ones. So who knows how they got there. Even in um, Gloucestershire, and there were some in Warminster that were reported, often in, um, 
in reed beds. And there's a famous one at Tully in Australia of a reed bed. And the tractor driver saw uh, a craft. He, he, he saw it as a craft, but it could have been a, something else. I don't, who knows what? Kind of rise out of it. And of course, often that's uh, dismissed as um, anecdotal. It's just one person saying they've seen something. I mean, it could be the jolly green giant. I mean, you know, we don't necessarily have to believe. So, so you sort of take a decision as to, as to whether you believe or how much of the story you believe. You, you don't doubt that you saw something, but what it is. So you enter this kind of complete gray area. And the circles, that was, maybe that was an object of the circles was to occupy that gray area, you know, which is why it was important not to claim the circles and say, I made that, because who cares if you made it? Who cares? Well, it, it matters that you made it, because we're going to ignore it now, because you've said you've made it. You know, they, they, they work, and they, they, they are effective, and have an affect people, uh, emotionally and uh, physically, even, um, if, they, if it's not known their origin. You know, in other words, if the people that made it don't own up to it and don't brag about it, you know. So we found ourselves occupying a kind of strange territory because by, by then, towards the late 90s, we were being asked to make circles for commercial purposes. Music bands, that kind of thing, festivals. Uh, in fact, Jim Schnabel and I put the first advert out in the, the Seriologist magazine um, advertising our services for weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs. and uh, for anything, any, any event, we'll come along and make a, a circle. And uh, it was put, just put there as a joke, but actually it came true and we started, you know, big companies started to hire us. So we decided that we would talk about the commercial stuff yeah, we make crop circles, we're famous for it. Uh, which ones have you made? Well, we're not going to tell you. That's not why we make it, to tell you we've made it. You know, so there, there is a residue of very important crop circles in the history of crop circles that have never been claimed and they never will be claimed because there was a, two philosophies, competing philosophies. Some people believed that they shouldn't tell people they've done it and some people can't help themselves telling people they've done it you know and uh, it's easy to recognize the most successful of those two depending on why you're doing it I suppose if you're doing it to you know sell yourself as a tattoo artist or something um, you know a really kind of mundane reason like that um, which, which drags the whole thing down yeah okay you're great successful but i'm talking about circles that continue to have an effect on people you know even if it's a only a photograph of it you know they continue to change people's behavior hopefully for the better you know and so we get into an idea of can it um, can it actually have a beneficial effect on people's health and mental health uh, physical health, mental health, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the answer is yes, it's, it will have some effect, you know, just as any artwork, well some artworks can have that effect as well. If you were uh, living in the um, 14th, 15th century and you were going to church, to the Duomo, and you look up at the, in Florence, you look up at the Duomo ceiling, um, that is going to have a big emotional effect on the viewer. It just does, you know, because it's a, it's fantastic. And so, what happened was that every year, uh, so there's a very simple reason why the circles become more complex or complicated as the year goes on. So the bigger, more complicated ones appear in late July, early August. Always have. There's a very simple reason for that. It's because at the beginning of the season, in late May, the nights are very short. So there's not a lot of stuff you can do 
uh, in the three or four hours sometimes of darkness when it starts to feel like it's getting light or you know say between 11 o'clock where in uh, summer it's uh, still quite light dusky um, and uh, three or four in the morning when it starts to get light there's not a lot you can do there's like three hours difference between that and August so you can do the real work uh, later, the more complicated stuff later on it's just a simple fact of, of how much light you have or, 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 or how much darkness you have to more to the point um, because you, you know and uh, but so the the masterpieces would always happen towards the end of the year uh, or the season and the whole point in of the whole practice as far as we were concerned was to push the envelope into how extraordinary we could make a circle because the object was for people to think that human beings couldn't have made it and therefore it becomes extraordinary and that amazing you know and the sad thing is that that tradition has sort of died out really the teams aren't big enough people can't get on well enough to form a big team without the competition so it's made up of small teams that simply aren't capable of doing the masterpieces and perhaps they just don't have the design skills either the sad fact of life and so I think the, the whole phenomenon is circular um, right now we're we're looking at the circling of the drain you know with pr some pretty pathetic looking circles hailed as masterpieces and the people who've done them think they're masterpieces um, but I think we'll come back and the magic will return at some point with something that's going to surprise people and that people are going to think is really truly extraordinary and have good reason for thinking it because they're going to say how the heck have people done that you know, therefore it couldn't be people so what is it you know so that i think the mystery and magic will return the mystery and magic sort of a hand in hand you know the magician that's why magicians don't tend to tell people how they've done their tricks so anyway well i don't I don't believe I've ever seen anything that it would be impossible for a person or, or people to make. So, and I've seen nothing, and I've been looking at them for 30 years. And I, I've, I've pretty much always felt that, um, I mean, I sensed the mystery and I loved that aspect of it, but I've never ever seen evidence in a circle of anything that, that, that reasonably suggested that it had been made by some sort of non-human entity, you know. Um, I've written papers suggesting how it could, for instance, how uh, sacred geometry can actually uh, set in a field, can actually um, re nitronize the soil and have beneficial effects and, on people. And so I, I know artists, Bill, with a spoon, for instance, who's made um, a massive uh, Hindu uh, mandala shapes like the Sri Yantra in the Oregon desert, uh, where he believes that it affected the wildlife and attracted animals. And, and when he's done it in a, in a gallery, it's attracted children to sit in a circle or, or you know, without actually being able to see the design, just the sort of energy it's giving off or See, we're lost for language of this sort of thing. So if something is happening like that, then that is really, really interesting. And uh, a lot of my doctorate was about myth and the power of myth. And the, there's a philosopher, Mary Midgley, who argued, rightly I think, that one of the really, really important things about myth is that it shows us where we need to investigate. It's because of myth that we're going to Mars, or we haven't. We, we want to go to Mars. It's because of the H.G. Wells and the, you know, earlier mythology around Mars, the canals. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. The, there's no canals on Mars now. We we know, but there was a belief that there was, and it excited people and. And it's shown us, and we now, we've always, you know, for the last hundred years or so, wanted to go to Mars. 
So myth has an important social role to play in, in attracting us, in telling us what to look at. And I think that, you know, that's one of the benefits of the circles is that it's generated this interest in shapes and symbol, symbology and uh, um, semiotics, you know, how we understand symbols and how we respond to signs and that sort of thing. Because hence the name of the movie, Signs, you know, that's what they are as well. They operate as that. And maybe uh, something really, really powerful will come out of it some knowledge that uh, there is actually an actual energetic power of some kind and maybe it's in how it interacts with our energetic energetics um, to recognize the power of symbology and now you asked me what would an alien crop circle look like I think that it would be way in advance of any of that and uh, but it would contain the same elements there'd be sacred geometry, there'd be some, because they would have um, a, a long time ago figured out that there is a connection and, uh, and the, the feelings we get, and the emotional responses we have to shapes and symbols and uh, the, uh, the way some things in photographs puncture the, uh, recognition and set off an emotional reaction like soldiers and nuns in a photograph you know it, it, it triggers some kind of response and uh, you know maybe the aliens would have figured out uh, all that and it would be just a, it would set them off in another direction of knowledge so it's a whole an epistemological issue you know what what makes us investigate what we always needed to investigate and it's mythology and how we create myths around subjects. So that, and that's what I find so interesting about the, um, the, the circles phenomenon, you know, because it, it triggers human behavior in all sorts of directions. And somebody might want to spend their life photographing them and selling calendars. And somebody might think, what is this relationship between shapes and human emotions and also physical health? You know, so there's a, there's, a, there's a, uh, an interesting question. And so you've got me being really interested in it and somebody like uh, Looney, uh, Freudian slip, not Looney, um, Lucy Pringle, who uh, has been looking at the same kind of relationships. Um, and I'm, I'm about to start laughing because I called her Looney. But uh, um, no, the relationship between the circles and the, sh you know, but there's a warning around all this. We used to think that if you visited the baths in Bath, that was beneficial to your health. And we assumed it was something about the water that was beneficial to our health. And we couldn't actually um, answer that uh, question with science you would test and this and, and nothing ever sort of matched up until we went to space when it was realized that uh, people came back with less heavy metals in their body due to weightlessness so it wasn't the water it was the weightlessness that was beneficial for the health it's believed and so um, there may be a lesson to learn there with the circles. It might not be the actual physicality of the flattened wheat that's doing it, but it's something to do with the relationship between what's there and, and us. You know. So, but it's worth investigating. It's worth looking at. You know, and it does revolve around the whole idea of the placebo effect or the healing response, as I like to call it, and um, you know, and dealing with those sorts of issues rather than dismissively, as uh, science tends to do sometimes, and be, you know, treat uh, the placebo as in sort of a derogative term, um, to actually turn it around and, and see it as something positive and something that really needs to be looked at. And I think good scientists are looking at it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it there, you know. So it's exciting. It could be potentially exciting. And it may have come, theoretically, from people going out and flattening wheat in nice patterns and
and creating an idea that people couldn't have done it, so therefore it must be some kind of uh, machine, what do they call it? The machine that comes down to, I think it's a, it's a Latin term, isn't it? Deus ex machina. What? Deus ex machina. Yes, exactly. Deus ex machina. Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, there's the plot and there's the convoluted uh, narrative. And then we need to end the play in five minutes. We need an answer. Boom, down comes the deus ex machina and, um, and sorts it all out and everything's well with the world, you know. But, uh, you know, I think in reality, things take a bit longer than that. But, you know, it's not to, the circles aren't to be dismissed because they may have some kind of value that isn't quite recognized yet. And it might not be the value that people think it is might not be this sort of dowsable energy source that is having a physical, it might be something far more subtle, you know, and if it is, great. You know. um, there has been for years now this, this myth, or as I see it, a kind of a, a way of acknowledging the man-made element, but uh, ring fencing that from the, the mystery. So in order to maintain the mystery, but uh, acknowledge the man-made. And uh, in a nutshell, it's kind of like uh, either, it has various forms. Uh, the aliens made us do it, you know. So the alien force is coming down and we are vessels who have somehow uh, got out of bed and got into our cars and driven to Wiltshire and you know, made these patterns, so possibly so unconsciously, you know. So it's actually nothing to do with us. That's very, very close to the old Renaissance idea um, of the artist sleeping and the angels doing his work, or her work. Um, the, the sleeping artist, you know, who, who isn't capable of such magnificent magnificence altar pieces or ceiling, you know. So uh, they make, they sort of um, knocked out the artist and the angels did it. And then the artist woke up and think, wow, look at that, I, I did that. Um, that's a variation on the same theme, you know. Um, I think there is a, a certain truth to it, but I think that the thing, no, no, I've never felt that I was somehow magically inspired to go and make a crop circle. I've always felt that it came from within me and the people I worked with also felt that it came, but we had one thing in common, that we were, we were, had careers in art. So it's actually quite a natural feeling to create, you know, to go out and make something much bigger and more magnificent than you've ever done before, or make something that you yourself, just like Doug Bauer did with his simple circle, that you yourself would like to see appear in a field, you know. Well, it's not going to happen unless somebody goes out and does it, you know, so you do it, yeah, and so that's what we did, um, sometimes two, three times a week, you know. Um, so that is an inspiration of sorts, but it's not coming from elsewhere necessarily. It's coming from the universe, let's say, but uh, it's the universe that we occupy and it's no... It's no real uh, difference on how we think about if we were going to make a painting or take a photograph or I, I think about a film I might make. Um, and there's a certain amount of, uh, a certain process, uh, you know, so um, it's the same process, me thinking, right, which film am I going to make next? What's, it, what's going to make it special? Uh, and the same feeling about, right, what crop circle am I going to make next? What am I, what's going to make it special? You know, how about this? And so that was where, you know, that was the sort of inspiration where the fractals came from in the 90s and, and just, just circles. I, mean, I was looking at in uh, Monique's exhibition just recently and I was seeing crop circles I haven't seen, and I've never seen photographs of. Um, and, you know, temple uh, maps, which were sort of, they, you know, they weren't circles, they were squares and huge and, uh, I look, um, right, right, you know, so the, the, the idea behind that was that it is bigger and more extraordinary and magnificent 
just in the same way as a, an altarpiece in a cathedral or a ceiling um, painting will, I mean, people queue up for hours to go and see the, the chapel in, in Rome. Um, why? Because they're going to have that sense of awe. And that was the same sense that uh, you wanted people to have at your crop circle, you know, and which sadly people don't have anymore, I don't think. They're not, none of them are really particularly awful, you know, in, in other words, inspiring awe. Um, they're kind, it's a light, light smoking um, nowadays. It's, uh, you think it's a pleasure, but it's not actually a pleasure. Um, it's something that you have to do to, to sort of get back up to normal when you need a cigarette. It's, it's because you're kind of operating, without a cigarette, you're operating subpar. And so you have to go outside and have a cigarette uh, because that will, it's not, not going to create great pleasure. It's something you have to do just to bring yourself back up. And that's the difficulty in giving up, you know. Um, but it's a bit like a, a crop circle there. They're okay, you know, they serve a purpose, but nobody's fainting at the sight of them because they're so magnificent, you know. And that's what I mean by circling the drain. I'm being a bit harsh, but uh, the inspiration just simply isn't there to go and make something and keep quiet about it that is going to uh, fill people with awe, you know. And that's what the circles were always about. And weirdly, that's what they were about when they were only 30 feet across. When Doug and Dave were going out with the back, with the, with the bar on the back of Doug's workshop and on their hands and knees flattening a, a 30 foot circle, in other words, going around about three times or five times, and, and then their knees hurt so much they'd go home. Um, that single circle was just as amazing as a 300 footer would be nowadays. You know or the 800 footer was on Milk Hill in 2000, the Galaxy, you know. That was amazing because it was so large. Um, and, but it was no more amazing than a simple circle in 1981. Doesn't, size isn't everything, you know. But uh, each year, as I said, we would have to push the envelope out, you know, push out the envelope, make things bigger and more amazing than they were the previous year, you know. And of course, there's a bit of a limit to that, you know, for often very pragmatic reasons. Um, couldn't get teams big enough, you know, control, you know, you've got to keep those, there's got to be a leader, you know, if you've got two leaders, things start to deteriorate, you know. And so, um, and so yeah, so there is an inspiration, but it's not necessarily uh, something supernatural. It's, uh, it's part of the magnificence of being a human being, is that people are inspired to create, you know, and to make amazing things, you know. So, and often, if they're lucky, people become artists and, and get to live that as part of their life. Uh, other people don't follow the same pathway and, they, and it goes, you know, and things are a, a drudge. And, uh, and when those people visit a crop circle, they're quite easily amazed, you know. Um, there's an awful lot, there's, a, there's an interesting relationship between crop circles and philistinism. People unable to uh, recognise the artistic qualities of what they're looking at, you know, because uh, they probably, you know, I'm generalising massively, but they might not go to galleries. They might not be into that kind of that element of surprise that is so enjoyable when you go into a gallery or see an artwork that inspires you. They're not in that loop. So um, sometimes, you know, and some people, uh, usually they're the higher echelon of crop circle expert, the gentleman farmer who think they know everything and uh, are able to explain everything about circles except that we're not quite ready to fully understand the problem yet. You know, it's always just around the corner, just like politicians, you know. And so it is true with crop circles, you know. The answer's been there, staring at people in the face. It's great that no one really takes any notice of it, because I think uh, it kills the magic. But, you know, so there's still the magic. But, uh, yeah, I think on, I think the circle will turn 
and one day there'll be a mystery come back again and uh, it'll all kick off and uh, good and we, you know I'd be really pleased and, you know I'd sit there in my slippers by the fire telling my I don't have grandchildren but uh, saying just go out into a field and with a plank and see what you can do just make it amazing but that's inspiration so they are inspired but perhaps not in the way people are suggesting there's a, a physicist attached to a Dutch research crop circle research group can't remember his name now it's not important uh, who wrote various papers about uh, as proofs uh, that, that the circles are made by little balls of light you know um, a lot of his data came from a young man who was basically a complete charlatan who used to make circles himself and then say that he'd seen a ball of light so this was picked up by the physicist and and the um, the theory led the facts so it wasn't the wasn't the facts leading the theory it was the opposite much like Terence Meaden a physicist who a meteorologist who came up with his plasma vortex. He was chasing the, uh, the predetermined theory that he already had, that it was the weather. And so um, this physicist in Holland was chasing the idea that it's a ball of light because there was some footage of balls of light. There's even some footage of balls of light supposedly making a crop circle. Um, and that was just a bit of, uh, you know, jiggery pokery that was a hoax that was a uh, it was a gap in the market what we need is actual footage of a ball of light making a crop circle and so it was created and some people know the, the history of it and uh, some people believe that it's authentic footage of a crop of a ball of light making a crop circle I know um, but I can say that I've seen footage the thing about footage of balls of light in a field is another strange sub-phenomenon and it's that in the narrative of the myth, a myth being a story that could be true or it could not be true, either way it's a myth, it's a story. So in, within the narrative of the story of the ball of light in a field so many of them there's a kind of a theme they're only ever seen by the person behind the camera they're often photographed at sunset or around the end of the day and so partly because of the telescopic nature of the lens uh, they appear to be traveling really fast because all this telescoped background is rushing by you know and so it's the idea that the thing has purpose you, you decide that what you're looking at has purpose now I know that feeling because I've stood across a field at night and seen a light that seems to be moving around um, and it looked and to me it had purpose it looked like it had purpose it turned out to be a, a bin fire that the farmer had set on the other side of the field so it was in a dustbin it was a fire you know brazier a brazier and but and it was the bumblebee effect of vision that made it move you know in the dark so um the reason now i've there was some famous footage by the joaquin brothers i think or, from years ago 1991 i think of this amazing footage they got and you could hear them hear the camera saying look look can't you see it can't you see it and, and then what 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 because they're seeing something completely different he's seeing a telescoped image of a thistle spore backlit by the sun and by a sort of a sunset going down in the you know and and it's so it's slightly lost its focus and it looks to be purposefully going around the field and they they're not seeing the same thing what they're seeing is a tiny little thistle spore 
but not through a tele uh, video lens, you know. So there's a whole mythology, and I know all that sounds quite dismissive, and some people would say, yeah, but what about this footage, and what about that footage? But most of the footages are the same, essentially the same. They have the same narrative. The cameraman is seeing, or the camera person is seeing something that everyone else isn't. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there are some curious footages. There's still one that was, uh, that uh, Steve, uh, um, photographed um, of a white uh, light going over the east field and, and, uh, in, and it went above a tractor driver, Leon, and he said, um, he said, yeah, I saw it, it was a shiny object, you know. So, I mean, that has at least has a different story about it, but, uh, you know, it's amazing what video cameras will do. And uh, I think most photographers will know I mean, we even see um, uh, f lens flare identified as UFOs or balls of orbs or balls of light. And any, anyone who's taken photographs with a decent camera will know why that's caused. We, you go on YouTube and you look up rainbows and you will have people seeing a rainbow in a fountain and thinking that that's magic, some su supernatural reason for it. And, and other people would say, well, actually, it's this, this, and this, and they'd be right. Uh, it's the way light interacts with water and the sun, and da da da. So, but it's, you know, but yeah, that's one of the, I think there's a desperation to find proof that crop circles could not be made by people. And that's part of the quest for that proof, you know, and then you get different levels of belief. Um, John McNish. A BBC cameraman caught a ball of light on film, but he and he released the footage in its entirety, and it came towards the camera and, could, and it had purpose and it was, appeared to be very purposeful and you know it's a fantastic ball of light footage. And if he'd have cut it, then it would have been. And the, but he didn't. He let the camera roll, and it became it came into focus. Obviously, it was a some sometime in August. Thistles release their spores, and there's bits of fluff flying everywhere, and they're very easy to catch. And uh, on certain days, they're you know, certain days are better for catching um, uh, orbital light phenomena than uh, than others. You know, and he let that camera roll, and you could see the you could see it was a thistle spore or a dandelion thing, or you know something like that. So that's pretty much my take, and I've never seen anything that's really kind of convinced me otherwise, I'm afraid. Although, um, people I trust, who fellow circle makers, have seen, had pretty interesting amber gambler sightings of lights at night that have sort of moved, quite evidently moved, and they've stood there and watched it. Everyone stopped working in the field and, and watched this thing and being quite spooked by it, you know, as, you, as we would be, because we don't know what it is. Uh, that, that's happened, um, and, uh, and we've experienced that at night. Um, and the aforementioned uh, imploding luminous balloons that seem to sort of collapse in on themselves with a big flash. You know, we've seen the actual origin of those flashes no idea what they are so, so i'm not poo-pooing all light phenomena it's just that not all light phenomena is supernatural you know and makes crop circles uh, poo-pooing any footage um, but i do know from my experience of writing and researching about the mexico city uh, uh, so total solar eclipse uh, in the 80s um, i think it was the 80s uh, where during a total eclipse you, you get an awful lot of UFO sightings um, but that's because the, the sky is going progressively darker or progressively lighter after the eclipse um, some planets or some uh, stars are brighter than people think they are especially in those conditions. And you get sort of uh, phenomena like uh, 
something that's moving around because it's handheld and it's uh, dipping in and out of clouds. Often uh, it's the relationship with the clouds that I think the, the term the people I, who made a video about this uh, used was playing peekaboo uh, behind the cloud and uh, as, if, as if it's interacting with us. And that's another, that's another element of all this thing is that the viewer often thinks, and this happens with crop circles as well, with light phenomena in, in wheat fields, um, they believe that the object is interacting with them. And there's this relationship and this resonance that is created uh, where the viewer uh, thinks that the object is communicating with them and they're relating to it. And so you get this resonance where the seer is seen by the object because the object is seen as some kind of eye in the sky. And so the viewer experiences being seen by the deity, let's call it. So he always goes back into 5,000 years into Hindu mysticism because Darshan is the same principle where you, and this is why eyes on Hindu idols are so sometimes so large with little black uh, pupils that you, you go to experience Darshan and it's to experience you looking at the object, the idol or the UFO or the dustbin fire or whatever it is, or a thistle spore and you experience it looking at you. So as soon as you've latched onto that, but it goes beyond that, you're experiencing yourself viewing it, viewing you, viewing it, viewing you, viewing it. So you've got this resonance and it's just you and the thing having this sort of mutual experience. Um, and you can do it with pretty much any, anything. I've argued that that's how round barrows were viewed as well. That it was the the, ancestor, the representing ancestors who were still had the capability of watching over, you know, and that's why they're on skylines. And so it was a form of kind of um, you know keeping somebody alive in a way. And uh, you know, it's classic ancestor worship, but, but also it's a form of control if you think you're being watched. Just like there are many religions where the you know omnipresent God. You know, um, so there's a little interaction going on between you and the light or the object, which I think is quite common. And certainly in a Catholic country like uh, Mexico, you would get these, you get priests who, who would explain this kind of connection and, and just suddenly you're working in a kind of a tunnel vision channel between you and the object as if everything the object does or thinks is about you. And it's a classic religious experience. So, uh, what, what, I mean, you can do it with just about anything. And I think in Mexico City, they were doing it with planets and, um, you know, uh, bright stars that, that seemed brighter than they should be at that time of day. But it was just coming out of the eclipse. The eclipse sort of did all this. So it's an interesting phenomenon. And it's, it's, it's weird because it's very difficult to pinpoint for sure what the thing is. It could be. Could, it could be a, a, some sort of a intelligent object or, or carrying intelligent beings or, you know, who knows. But um, they're often quite uh, nebulous. They're often quite like, you've just shown me one that was really beautifully fuzzy around the edges, you know, and yet often treated the same as if it's made of stainless steel and, uh, you know, a classic flying saucer. Um, who knows, maybe the nebulous cotton woolly kind of edge is some something they just press a button to create you know who knows but um you know some interesting some interesting phenomenon that is well known not only in ufology but also in religion and other areas and came to the crop fields of britain as well in the form of balls of light the balls of light that make crop circles it all ties into a larger and larger myth so interesting whole part of the narrative.